The bright side of addiction is recovery. If you're in recovery or know someone or love someone who is or maybe simply want to know more about the recovery process, well, this podcast is for you. This is a podcast that helps carry the message of hope and the promise of recovery. And a reminder, you can find all of our podcasts at recoverycoasttocoast.org. Recovery is living proof. Now, here's something to think about. A question, if you will. Is codependency a myth? Should it be referred to perhaps as pro-dependency? Well, this edition of Recovery Coast to Coast, we're going to take a new look at codependency. And Dr. Rob Weiss will point out the fact that while codependency has been around since the 70s, it really doesn't exist. It's really the wrong way to deal with those who love someone in active addiction. Here's a quick clip from today's interview. Someone who has spent a part of their life caring for a troubled addict and hanging in there in their worst of times, I call those people heroes. I say that they are incredibly strong for having lived with the hope that their family will come back together. And the last thing I want to do is call them names like codependent. Dr. Rob has been in the field of addiction treatment for decades, and instead of labeling people as being codependent, he's coined the term prodependence, which he will explain in great detail. And then we're going to hear some words of wisdom from actress Allie McGraw talking about approval from others. Recovery is as recovery does. I'm Neil Scott, host of Recovery Coast to Coast. Our website, recoverycoasttocoast.org. You can find all of our podcasts there. Following 15 years of nightly broadcasting on iHeartRadio in Seattle, we have now upgraded to a national podcast available to anyone, anytime, featuring interviews with everyday people in long-term recovery, as well as clinicians and authors and frontline treatment professionals and recovering celebrities, newsmakers, and others who offer the promise of hope and the reality of recovery. Plus, well-vetted resources for individuals, families, and friends. We invite you to enjoy it and to share it with your friends as well. Recovery is an American way of life. A reminder, our email address is recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net. By golly, I'd love to hear from you. Recovery Coast to Coast, supported by Sundown M Ranch, one of America's oldest, least expensive, and most successful treatment programs in the country. One of the questions I get all the time is, how do you find the right treatment center for a loved one or a friend? Well, it's an excellent question, and it has, frankly, a complicated answer. Now, keep in mind that a decision to seek treatment for addiction is usually accompanied by a crisis. Uh, Time usually is of the essence. There's nothing for me anyway, nothing more frustrating than to have someone agree to go into treatment, and then you don't know who to call or where to start. Or if you call a facility and find out there's no beds available, then there's the whole insurance component. Man, it's frustrating, and it's time-consuming, and it's overwhelming. Let's face it, there are a lot of treatment centers in this country that are trying to fill beds and, frankly, make money. There's a lot of bad actors out there that will offer a lot and deliver a little. Lots of sizzle, not a whole lot of steak. So how do you find the right treatment program for your loved one or friend? Well, first of all, research their reputation. Are they licensed, certified? How long have they been around? Who are their primary staff members? And this one is important. Are they members of NAATP, the National Association of Addiction Treatment Providers? Their mission at NAATP is to provide leadership, advocacy, training, ethics, and member support services to ensure the availability and highest quality of addiction treatment. Sundown M Ranch checks all the boxes and more. They're certified and accredited. They have been successfully treating individuals and their families for nearly 55 years. Their staff, well-paid, love working there. They've been together a long time. Many actually are alumni of Sundown, and they are proud members of NAATP. Sundown is a not-for-profit center located on over 30 acres of land at the mouth of the gorgeous Yakima River Canyon. It's land that they own. This allows them to keep their rates low, in fact, among the lowest in the country. 
And they don't just treat and release. Their continuing care program is a commitment to long-term recovery. Now, even if you're not considering a treatment program right at the moment, I invite you to take a quick look at their website and become familiar with their program. It's outstanding. It's a patient-centered program. Sundown.org, where long-term recovery begins. I'm excited to share my conversation with Dr. Rob Weiss. He's a chief clinical officer of a program in Southern California called Seeking Integrity. Love that name. He's developed a new paradigm for family members and friends of those who are addicted. It's bringing an end to codependency and moving to a much different model, pro-dependence. His new book is called Pro-Dependence Beyond the Myth of Codependency. Here's my conversation with Dr. Rob, who had just come off the stage at the 48th Annual TAP Conference down in San Antonio, Texas. TAP is the Texas Association of Treatment Professionals, where he delivered the keynote presentation, Growing Past the Myth of Codependency. Talking in this segment with, uh, with somebody who was on the podcast a while back, uh, talking about porn addiction, you may remember Dr. Rob Weiss. If you had, did not hear that one, go to recoverycoasttocoast.org. It is available, and you can download that as well. He's the chief clinical officer of Seeking Integrity down in Southern California. We'll talk a little bit about that. He's a provocateur, as I like to say, a proponent of pro-dependency. And according to Dr. Rob, codependency, despite what you've heard, does not exist. There's a paradigm shift in terms of pro-dependency. Dr. Weiss was the keynote speaker here at the conference and nice enough to stop by our broadcast location to talk a little bit more about it. Rob, good to see you. Good to meet you in the flesh. Neil, um, I just really value what you do here. And I've said it before, but you change a lot of lives. Well, and so do you. I change a few at a time. You change lots of them. So thank you for doing what you do. Well, it means a lot to me. Thank you. Let's get right to the meat of the matter. Why no codependency? Well, there are technical reasons. Mm -hmm. As a professional, I need some kind of something that's called a diagnosis, which means that I can identify what the issues are that someone has and call them something. You know, I'm told what depression is. I'm told what anxiety is. Codependency has never been a diagnosis. There is no research to support it. So as a therapist, as an addiction counselor, you know, I don't really know what I'm even treating because if I'm in New York, Someone says they're codependent, but I live in Ohio. We may not even be talking about the same thing. So for, as a professional standpoint of view, it's not a diagnosis. It doesn't have the research support it. You can't bill insurance for it. Mm -hmm. And really, it's more of an idea of something than it actually is a, a fact. I came into this field in the mid-'70s with Sharon Wegscheider and Claudia Black and, and, gosh, all of those. It has been in the lexicon f for decades of codependency. Now you're saying, let's not use it. Well, they used to say people who couldn't hear had a tin ear, but they don't say that anymore either. So yeah, um, yeah. I think the language is changing. When I came into the field, they actually referred to people in recovery as reformed alcoholics. It's changed. I it's haven't gotten evolved. that far with that one. Yeah. Someone who is an alcoholic now has a substance use disorder. I mean, we change all of these terms, yeah. but, but I'm talking about something that has a history of really picking people apart who are in a crisis. This is the reason why I wrote Pro-Dependence, is I really believe that the, the attitude and the focus that we need to have toward loved ones of addicts and family members of addicts and children of addicts, are when we look toward the people who love these people, we need to love on them. I'm not interested in the wife of an alcoholic's trauma history and what she went through. I'm interested in helping her get through the day and telling her what a hero she is for having hung in there with that difficult relationship. You know, you've heard me say, Neil, if I had cancer, God forbid, mm. and my wife was taking care of me, everyone would call her an angel. But if I'm an addict and she's taking care of me, there's something wrong with her. She's codependent. And I don't really understand why we don't appreciate, value, and love on the people who support us when we're in our worst moments. Talk about the cultural aspect of all of this. Well, I, I think that codependency was the right message for its time. It was in the 70s and 80s, which is very much a time where women wanted to break free of dependencies mm -hmm. and they wanted to break the glass ceiling and get men out of the way. And so a woman leaning into and depending on and supporting a man wasn't really the message that women were looking for in the 1980s. 
I also want to say that, you know, I do love and appreciate and value you know, Claudia and Pia Melody, mm -hmm. and although I know many of these folks, but the reality is, is the books that they wrote were based on their own experience. They grew up with abusive fathers, yeah. they married alcoholic husbands, and they wrote about the idea of this. And it's interesting idea, it's a fascinating idea, but it's never been proven. Research does not support it. There are 400 books on the topic, which is the right one. And really, no researcher has actually written about this book. All of the books that are written about codependency are self-help. They're written by therapists, which is great, but that doesn't mean that we have the huevos to support it. Tell me about pro-dependency. When did you come up with that idea? And how is it being accepted? Well, I'd like to think I came up with the idea way back in the 90s when I had a deeply mentally ill alcoholic mother. And she would wander around in the rain, and she wouldn't mm. take her medications, and she would be on the street. And, you know, people used to say to me, well, your mother's just going to suffer until she takes responsibility for her life, and you need to leave her out there, and, you know, how's she going to figure it out? And I just thought, you know, I am never going to leave my mother out in the rain. I am never going to let my mother become homeless. I don't care how much she drinks. That's never going to happen. And I knew then that there was something wrong with the idea of moving away from the person who is sick or troubled and focusing on yourself because you're in a family, you love each other, you should be there for them and it is exhausting to take care of someone you love. But boy, I never wanted to be the therapist who told some family member to let their son go out there and figure it out and then he died on the street. Mm. And by the way, we know that one of the best opportunities people have to recover is when their families and loved ones are involved Absolutely. in their treatment. And codependency has said, step aside, let them do it on their own, let them mm. struggle. I, I just don't think that's the right message. Detach is a big word, detach. And, and what you're talking about is support rather than detaching. Well, I don't yeah. think there's anything wrong with being mm -hmm. attached to the people that you love right, and supporting right. them when they're struggling. And I think it's counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense to me. Mm. You know, again, if my mom had cancer, to say, well, detach and move to another city and let her struggle. <laughs> Excuse me, that doesn't make any sense to me. So if she's alcoholic and drinking and falling on her face, why would detachment be any more helpful in that situation? My job as a family member, uh, as someone who loves a family member, my job as a therapist is to love on those people. Someone who has spent a part of their life caring for a troubled addict and hanging in there in their worst of times, I call those people heroes. I say that they are incredibly strong for having lived with the hope that their family will come back together. And the last thing I want to do is call them names like codependent. In your talk this morning, you talked about how therapists often diagnose before even meeting the client. Well, it, as a mental health professional, I don't diagnose someone who's depressed because they give me a call and they say they're depressed. I don't diagnose someone because they think they have an eating disorder and they come in my office and they're overweight. I diagnose them based on my medical, psychological, and addiction understanding of their problem. It is only in the addiction world where we make an assumption about what is wrong with someone before they even come in our office, before we've even met them. And this is in part the problem with codependency is if you're married to or the child of or your child is an addict, you are immediately assumed without question that you're codependent and you have these characteristics and this is your problem and how do we know? That just doesn't really work because what I'm interested in is looking at the individual and what they are struggling with, not giving you know overarching global names to people I've never met. What about gender bias? Uh, I mean, we, when we think of codependency, oftentimes we think of, quote, the wife. Certainly the focus in self-help and the codependency movement has always been on women. Women read 95% of all self-help books. Women are the ones who tend to be more compassionate, more nurturing, more emotionally engaged. These are traits that women carry with, with great regard, and they were told to be more like men back then. You know, if you're going to achieve, you're going to do well, you got to push your way through the glass ceiling, you got to be assertive, you can't depend on other people, you got to make it on your own. And listen, to women who were listening to 9 to 5 and watching that whole period where they didn't feel empowered, that was the right message for their work life and their intellectual life. But when it bled into personal lives and we're told to detach and focus on ourselves, and that doesn't help relationships. And to be honest, I think sometimes about the people in the 90s who might still be married today, had they not been told that mm. their codependency and enmeshment and overattachment was destroying them. I, I just don't believe that.
and and oftentimes it, it as you mentioned today it's the perfect out for the addict to say well you know it's my wife the co she if she wasn't so codependent i wouldn't be drinking yes addicts love codependency yeah. because if it's another reason to say well it's not my fault <laughs> if she just wouldn't nag if he just wouldn't complain i wouldn't drink and of course the message i give to any family member or loved one of an addict is there's nothing you could ever do to make an addict drink. In case you didn't hear that, there's nothing you could ever do to make an addict act out. You can make them miserable, for sure. You can make them unhappy. <laughs> you can yell at them, scream at them, but then they can go for a walk. They can go play with a dog. They can go to a meeting. The decision to drink or use doesn't come from you're making them unhappy or because you're codependent. The decision to drink or use or act out comes because that's what they want to do mm -hmm. and they want to find something else to blame and codependency has now given them something else to blame. It's her nagging. It's his problems that he's inflicting on me who what, what's a guy to do except drink when you're married to this person well go for a walk get a divorce lots mm. of choices mm -mm. the importance of of making this change in the field it's going to take time a, a dynamic shift is going to take time are you sensing that people are starting to listen to what you're saying and spreading the word i was impressed with the number of people came up to you after this meeting today and said my god i've never thought about it that way this is something I need to share with my colleagues. Pro-dependence, not codependence. Well, you have to give TAP and this organization some real credit mm -hmm. because they have almost a thousand people here. I think people I are really it. hungry to connect and listen to things, and they're very ready for new ideas. And, and they're open. Well, you have to understand, when I talk about this, people say, I've been thinking about this for years. I've been wanting to. How could you write this book? It's the one I wanted to write. <laughs> and it's because I think codependency has become a little tired and it doesn't apply and younger therapists are coming up and saying this doesn't make any sense to me because attachment, connection, relationships, dependency is where it's at. And so why would you blame anyone for the love that they give? So the world is shifting. I think I just wrote into it. But I also know, as you said, you know, Neil, it's going to take a while because you have a deeply embedded concept in yeah. the culture and in the therapy culture with no proof, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's very much embedded. I don't know that I'll be alive to see the influence of this kind of thinking over mm. time because this is an organic thing that happens. One person buys a book, they give it to their brother, somebody else buys it and gives them to their staff, they hear me talk. So I won't be around, this is going to take a very long time, but I do think that people are hungry for more loving and compassionate and nurturing ways to look at the people who hang, out, hang in there with us difficult addicts. Part of a paradigm shift has to do with changing the conversation. You had a great slide up there today about the, you know, the terms that we have used and what we could use. Share a couple of those if you would. I can always say something bad about somebody. I can always look at some part of them and say, I could say, you know, Neil could have done a better job addressing today and he didn't really put on the right clothes for this conference. That's a lot of judgment. Or I could turn around and I could say, you know, Neil was in such a hurry this morning and he wanted to be here so much and he didn't want to disappoint anyone by being late. So he didn't, you know, throw on the clothes, he just threw on the clothes he had. Why would I blame somebody for doing the best they can? And so, yeah, that is the paradigm shift. Instead of saying, saying enabling, why don't we say deeply involved? Mm. Instead of saying afraid, why don't we say they're fearful of things they've already been through? Uh, instead of saying they're controlling, why don't we say they're doing everything they can to help their family? So we've taken on this very judgmental language for people. Things do, absolutely. People do, absolutely. But do we have to look at them as something they're doing wrong rather than saying this is the best they can do based on the circumstances they're in? And you know, by the, by the way, Neil, one of the things I like to joke about is how many families of alcoholics or addicts you know, went to graduate school and studied addiction. But some Somehow we expect this family member to know how to do it right, yeah. to not enable, to not enmesh yeah. all that stuff. And I think people are just doing their best to love on somebody who's failing. And, and language is so important. There, there are several several terms that uh, that have been common in the field that I have changed. One of them is relapse prevention. I no longer use that. I call it recovery enhancement. Tell me how your recovery is better today than it was yesterday. And how will you make it better tomorrow than it is today? Recovery enhancement rather than relapse prevention. And a lot of times in treatment, we hear relapse prevention. And someone says, well, you know, he's been out two or three times. I guess I can probably go out ag again. I'm owed a relapse because everybody else has had one. Bullshit. <laughs> 
It's recovery enhancement. Work on you. I don't use the word abuse, alcohol abuse. If, if I want to abuse alcohol, I'll take a bottle of Jack Daniels and throw it against the wall. That's alcohol <laughs> abuse. How about the harmful use of alcohol and other drugs? And the whole thing of substance abuse. I don't know anybody who says on a, on a Friday night, let's go do some substances. Or raises their hand in a meeting and says, hi, I have a substance use disorder. Of course not, Rob. Well, well the medical field doesn't like the word addiction, period. And they Obviously. will not put the word addiction or alcoholism into their right. guides. They don't, they don't like to use those words for a whole bunch of reasons. Right. But I wanted to just jump on what you said because when I was growing up in the mental health field, we used to word that, use this word discharge plan. Yeah, which yeah, meant what yeah. were we going to give them to do as they were leaving and what was the plan for their leaving now we use the term aftercare plan and it seems simple but what I'm interested in now is not the discharge but what are they going to do later what are yeah. they going to do after how can we give them a plan for living life not just what to do when they're leaving and so yeah those are subtle shifts in language that make a big deal in how we look at it. you bring up a good point in terms of the discharge plan and aftercare that's another word I no longer use. I don't use aftercare because when you say aftercare, there, right. there's there's a shift that happens there, mm -hmm. and, and it's almost partly up to the up to the client or the patient. Well, there's also aftercare that I can also do. Mm -hmm. I use continuing care. Mm -hmm. There you go. Because it is a process. Right. Uh, and and unfortunately, many people in this country who don't know a lot about addiction think well. You go to treatment for three weeks and you're going to be fine and life gets back to normal. Well, and we also need to deal with your family's codependency because it's really driving your addiction yeah. <laughs> as opposed to your family's craziness has been driven by the addiction and they are affected by the addiction rather than contributing to it. That's codependence. You've written how many books now on prodependence? I've written three books on prodependence, uh, two of them in print right now. One came out last May, or in May of 2022, and it's called Practicing Prodependence. And that's a book for therapists, That's the word, or, or and counselors. That's why the word practicing mm -hmm. is in there, because, like you said, taking the shift is difficult. Yeah. And I actually have to put the words in people's mouths, like, if someone comes to you and their husband's alcoholic, instead of saying this, try that. And so I really need to teach therapists. It's such a big shift, as you said. And then there's another book called Prodependence Beyond the Codependency Myth. And that's a book for family members to read and regular old folks to come to terms with the love that they've given their families without blaming themselves. And you know, I got to say, Neil, one of the greatest gifts to me, you know, I've stood in book lines forever signing books. I'm very grateful to have that opportunity. And people go by and they buy a book, they sign a book, you know, I sign a book. But with Prodependence, people come along and they buy five. I had a woman today, today, who came to the conference, came up to me afterward and burst into tears and said, this is the first time that someone has told me that I am not responsible for my son's death, that I, my behavior did not cause him to die because codependency told me for years, what is my part? How did I contribute? My son is dead. Why do I want to look at what's wrong with me? I already feel like it's my fault. And she was in tears because I had said to her, look, maybe you did the best you could. In fact, maybe you went to the wall for your son, and unfortunately he didn't make it, but that was on him. Yeah. It was his decision to go out there, not yours. Maybe we're not too far away from a book called Pro-Dependency for Dummies. <laughs> well, um, I, I, as I said Because there is codependency for dummies. Well, there's also picking your nails for dummies. I mean, there's every, you know, how to clean my, my uh, dishwasher for dummies. Uh, that doesn't mean it's particularly accurate. Yeah. But, you know, it's interesting you say that because to say codependency for dummies means, what does this mean? Yeah. yeah. How do we figure this out? How do we, yeah. you know, because for dummies is I don't understand it. Yeah, well, who wants to read a book for dummies? Well, First of all, <laughs> you got to own your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I know where I'm a dummy. I was trying to fix the tech stuff when I was, I was trying to talk this morning, and Mike didn't work or whatever, and I thought, this is not my expertise. Yes, I need yeah. mics for dummies. Stay in your own lane. I don't need depression for dummies. Yeah, I don't yeah, need yeah. grief for dummies. You know, we already know those ideas. I think there's a reason why codependency has 400 and something books to explain it and because it just doesn't have a clear I mean like I said it's never been a diagnosis you can't bill an insurance company as a therapist for codependency mm. because they don't believe it exists because it, it it really doesn't formally exist in mental health and addiction language thus the myth which was part of your title today and it's a great myth you know myths are are an opportunity for us to to think of 
ideas and things that are bigger than us that guide us, but they're not necessarily true. You know, there's the myth of Atlas who's holding the world on his shoulders, and boy, do I feel like an ad <laughs> Atlas on a lot of addiction work. It's a good metaphor, but Atlas doesn't really exist. Yeah. You, you also had a, a, an analogy, to the pie analogy. I talk a little bit about that. Well, I've always wanted to be in a relationship. You know, I think as an addict, I didn't have much of a family, and so a part of me has always longed to create a family and be a part of a family. And so I always wanted to be in a relationship that was really important to me. And I remember, couldn't achieve it because I was such an effed up addict. Mm. But I remember going to therapy very early on and I, this counselor said, I said to the counselor, you know what I really want? I want to be half a pie and I want my partner to be half a pie and together we're gonna be a pie. And he said to me, and very much in the codependency vein, no, you, you don't understand, Rob. Uh, you're a pie and they're a pie. And then together you're two pies. Well, that's just not how life works. Nobody is perfect, nobody is full, nobody is complete, and nobody runs to another person when they have it together. In truth, you are half the pie, and I am half the pie, and that's what a relationship is all about. You contribute to my vulnerability, I lend my strengths to you. We are well paired, and that is a pie that fits together. Dr. Weiss is the author of Pro-Dependency Beyond the Myth of Codependence. It's available at all the usual places, including Amazon, I assume. You're kind of doing this one workshop at a time, one group at a time, one patient at a time. Are there others who are picking up the mantle? Most therapists who hear me talk say things like, I've been thinking that way for a very long time, or I haven't liked yeah. codependency in a while, but the truth is we have had nothing else. No model, no name, no label. I'm sure that people are doing more compassionate, more strength-based, and more loving work with families and loved ones of alcoholics, but they don't have a name for it, and addicts. So I gave it a name. I said, a dependency is a good thing. Let's look at it as a pro thing rather than a con thing. Yeah. And I think what I hear from therapists is they're really responding to it because they're already waiting for it to happen. Yeah. And there it is. Yeah. Uh, tell me about Seeking Integrity, the treatment center you're involved with. Well, I've been doing treatment with men with intimacy and sexual disorders my whole career. And of course, a lot of this comes out of trauma and abuse in their early childhood. But just like me, a lot of these men long to have deep and enduring relationships and family lives. But instead, they go out and have affairs and see, go to massage parlors and spend mm. four hours a day online with porn because they're so broken. And they come to us for treatment when their lives are falling apart because they've cheated so many times, they've gotten in trouble at work because they're looking at porn, they lost a license. They come in because their lives are on the line as they know them related to their romantic and sexual behavior. And that's what we do. We work specifically with those men. And I will also say that I'm very interested in the relationship between drug and alcohol problems and intimacy and sex. And there are a lot of people who go through wonderful drug and alcohol treatment, but no one ever talks to them about sex or those kinds of problems. And for some people, that drives their addiction. Yeah. So they get out of treatment, they've only had half of what they need. So I'm very motivated in looking at their relationship and treating people who might have a drug problem and a sex problem, or their drug problem is driven by sexual issues that happened in the past, because we simply don't talk about that enough in treatment, especially drug and alcohol treatment. The website is seekingintegrity.com, but I want to go back real quick to pro there are CODA meetings. There have been CODA meetings forever. Is there going to be a pro-dependence meeting? Yeah, I don't think people are pro-dependent. I don't think that's a label. I think it's a way of living and a way mm. of looking at life, which is that we need each other, we love each other, and when someone falls down, we get, we get down on our knees and we pick them up. They can show pro-dependent characteristics. They can live in a pro-dependent mm. way. But I would never label as someone as a problem. So I go to meetings because I have a chronic problem that I want to put into some kind of remission or stability. I want to celebrate people's pro-dependence. So no, I don't know that there'll ever be meetings. If there were, someone would have to say something like, I am powerless over the love that I have for others and what it might lead me to do. What's your thoughts on al -Anon? I love Al-Anon. I think it is the place to go, but I also think that it's been somewhat tainted and corrupted by codependency. Yeah, absolutely. And this idea that, which really comes out of codependency, that I'm addicted to my son, to my mother, to my my partner because their alcoholism has left me addicted to them. And that was never Al-Anon's purpose. Al-Anon's purpose was to look at the wife's obsession with her husband's drinking. That was the original focus. Yeah. So it never said I'm addicted to someone. It said I'm obsessed with the problem. And that makes a lot of sense to me. So before I send someone to any meeting, 
I'm going to make sure that they feel deeply and securely within themselves that the problem in their family member is not their fault because they will get a lot of that message no matter where they go. Again, the book is called Prodependence, The End of Codependency. Do yourself a favor. Give yourself a gift. And that gift would be the book by Rob Weiss. The book is called Prodependency, Beyond the Myth of Codependence. The author is Rob Weiss, and he is the chief clinical officer at Seeking Integrity, seekingintegrity.com. Rob, it's been a pleasure to meet you in person. I enjoyed our phone conversation and would love to have you on the show again. And you know what, folks? Neil is cuter in person than you. <laughs> use his, and you probably cut that out, but I just want to tell you that. In case I have you a face for him. radio. Thank you, Neil. I really appreciate your time and everything you do. Again, our thanks to Dr. Rob Weiss, and you can find more about Dr. Rob's work and contact him directly as well by going to seekingintegrity, one word, dot com. And by the way, I want to remind listeners of this podcast, if you'd like to tell your story of recovery, regardless of the path that you've chosen, as long as you have been in continuous recovery, for a year or more, drop us a note at recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net. Now, in just 30 seconds, we'll hear from legendary actress Ally McGraw with reflections on approval from others. Stay with us. Are you afraid? Afraid of life without drugs and alcohol? There is help and hope at Sundown M Ranch. At Sundown, the focus is on you and your disease. You will learn how to live without depending on drugs and alcohol. Sundown M Ranch is nationally recognized for effective and affordable alcohol and drug treatment programs. Reclaim your life. Replace your fears with hope. Go to www.sundown.org right now to learn more. And now a thought for the day from an iconic actress who is in long-term recovery, award-winning actress Ally McGraw, on approval from others. <laughs> We can't help being a little embarrassed when we remember how the need for approval controlled our lives. It influenced our thoughts, opinions, and just about everything we did. The need to be liked, admired, respected, and accepted by everyone was one of the hardest things to let go of in recovery, and for good reason. We had been that way all of our lives. We were fragile, fearful, and insecure. We needed all the strokes we could get. In fact, we depended on them for what little self-esteem we had. Building self-esteem from within rather than from the outside, that remains a primary challenge in recovery. We try to do what is right for us, to make choices based on our own personal wants, likes, and needs, from clothing styles to career decisions. We try to know and be ourselves. To make all of that possible, we've had to really concentrate on letting go of the idea that we're not okay unless we have the approval of others. Come to think of it, outside approval never made any real difference in our lives. Inside approval, on the other hand, has made all of the difference. Thought for today, I will release myself from the illusion that I need other people's approval to be happy. Well, that wraps up this edition of the National Podcast, Recovery Coast to Coast. If you've enjoyed the podcast, we'd love to hear from you. Our email is recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net. Let us know where you listen from. Also, please hit the subscribe or follow button. It's free, and you'll be notified the next time we publish a podcast. All podcasts available at recoverycoasttocoast.org. We encourage you to share this podcast and all of our podcasts on social media. And remember, if you know someone who's experiencing problems with alcohol or any other drug, here's a 24-hour national helpline that offers free information and confidential treatment referrals. Spanish-speaking individuals are available as well. 1-800-622-HELP. And join us next time for America's Voice for Recovery, Recovery Coast to Coast, the national podcast. And another shout out to our sponsoring organization, Sundown M Ranch, successfully treating individuals, including adolescents and their families, for almost 55 years. Sundown.org. I'm Neil Scott, reminding you to stay healthy, live in gratitude, 
and be kind to others. Remember, the bright side of addiction is recovery. Pass it on.